Welcome uh, everyone here to the Salt Lake City Planning uh, Division's appealing, Appeals Hearing for Salt Lake City. Uh, uh, it's now past the start time of 4 o'clock. Uh, as you heard from uh, Wayne Mills, just to let everybody know again, it, although um, everybody may have heard, uh, our agenda is as follows. We'll first hear uh, the appeal of a planning commission decision uh, for the Windsor Court Plan development at 1966 South Windsor Street. And because that is an appeal of a planning commission decision where a public hearing has already been held, uh, uh, this matter is not a public hearing, although meaning that members of the public uh, will not be allowed to speak. However, they're certainly welcome to participate and listen in on, on the uh, on the the discussion and the presentations. Uh, the the second item on the agenda, because it is a public hearing as an appeal of an administrative decision on the St. Mary's Stealth Antenna, at 2496 St. Mary's Drive. Uh, because that is a public hearing, as Mr. Mills stated, that uh, we will not have the the uh, that matter cannot be heard until uh, after 5 p.m. So uh, if anybody's here for the stealth antenna appeal, uh, that will be heard at, at 5 p.m. Uh, at this same link. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll now hear uh, the case number PLN APP 2021-00063. And uh, what I'd like to uh, first hear from uh, Katya Pace, the uh, city staff uh, uh, planning member, and then have uh, her just, just briefly d d describe the context and, and um, uh, the, the history there. And then we'll turn uh, time over to the appellant and uh, any appellant representatives to um, uh, to present uh, their uh, their their thoughts and matters and items uh, on, on the case, Katya. Thank you. So this is an appeal from Lance Howe, the property owner, regarding the decision of the planning commission to deny a request for a plan development to modify the front yard setback and a parking buffer landscaping requirement on the RMF 35 zoning district. Uh, the plan development is for a 17 unit rental residential building at the address um, specified 1966 South Windsor Street. Uh, it's on a vacant lot in the middle of a block located uh, between 800 East and 900 East and Ramona Avenue and Redondo Avenue. Uh, the access for this property would be mainly from Windsor Street. And there is also, also a, a Parley's Creek that runs as a culvert underneath the parcel. Uh, the planning commission, um, the planning staff report recommended approval for this uh, project. However, uh, on January 13, 2021, the Planning Commission voted unanimously to deny the request for the plan uh, development. And it based the decision to deny uh, this plan development um, based on that um, the plan development did not meet standard C3 from section 21A uh, 55.050 of the Salt Lake City Zoning Ordinance. And um, that that's mostly the, the introduction to the, the, the project. Is there any questions that specific questions that you would like? me to uh, talk about uh no thank you that's that, that that's helpful to put this in in, in context uh thank you 
Um, and as far as far as uh, the uh, appellants, I see that we have Lance Howell, the uh, property owner and appellant on and also Mike Spain, Howard, who I think was also going to speak. I'll turn the time over to one or both of, of, of those gentlemen um, if they'd like to uh, uh, take some time now. And, it, and again, just as a reminder to, to help them, my, my job is I my ability as an appeals hearing officer, I have to make a decision based on the record. So it has to be, uh, we can't introduce new evidence in this hearing. It has to be pointed out that something in that planning commission hearing uh, uh, was um, you know, in, incorrect or in the words of, of, of the law that it, um, that the decision was not supported by substantial evidence and that, or that it violates a law statute or ordinance in effect. And so if, if you could help me by pointing out those areas, uh, that, that, that would be very helpful because that onus or that responsibility for doing so rests upon the uh, 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 appellant. So anyway, uh, Mr. Howell, Mr. Spainhauer, uh, you know, I'll, uh, the time is yours. And I'll give it, we'll have the city have an opportunity to respond after, if, if they wish, after you uh, speak, and there may be questions along the way as well. Lance, do you want me to just go ahead? Okay. So I'll just go in. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Is this okay. uh, Michael? Mike Spain. Okay, Mike, thank you. Great. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so yeah, reading through the report, I can understand that there's uh, a point where there's it's just an opinion uh, that they made a wrong decision, but all this was based on their wrong perception of the front yard area. They had the a big concern about the south property line being the front yard uh, line and technically and by law it is the front yard because it's the only point of the property that has frontage to a public street and so their their whole opinion was based on the fact that the front yard shouldn't be the south property line and so that's where we're saying that was erroneous. Uh, and she, there was a commission, a member that just said untruths about the east property line should be the front yard setback area. When by law, it is the south property line that is the front yard setback. And I'd like to see if Katya can uh, give some background on when she recommended uh, to us that the south property line be the front yard setback area. Because there was, there was other things that went into that besides just wanting to have a front yard setback exception. Mr. Ward, so I think that's was, a request for uh, material that's not in the record to be considered. And I would object to that. Okay, so the appellant has asked for Katia Pace to uh, provide um, some evidence that was not part of the planning commission decision, and 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 that and that is that is right. That cannot be considered. Uh, but uh, I do understand your point and, and have uh, made note of it that, and if I'm just correct, as, as I understand it, your testimony is, and uh, having uh, listened to the planning commission uh, meeting uh, as well as that, that you, your understanding is that the planning commission had, in your words, an erroneous understanding that, that somehow the, uh, the frontage uh, the, the front line of the property was somehow um, could somehow be changed. And your point is, 
it, it can't because that's the law. It's wherever the frontage is to a public uh, street. And, and you're saying that was misunderstood by the planning commission. Is that, is that correct, Mike? That's correct. Okay, that's, that, that's helpful. Why don't you continue on? So based on their, their discussions with each other, uh, based on that front yard, they, they, uh, they, it was their opinion that they wanted a different entrance. And so all that, all their discussion was based on the fact that they were disagreeing with the south property line being the front property line. And, and, and if you will, Mike, just take me through a, a little bit more as to how that led to their decision. So you're saying they, Erroneous, they essentially wanted a different frontage on the property. Do you, is it, Correct. is it your opinion that if they, if they, if you had changed the frontage, that it would have changed the outcome of, of the decision? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, uh, well, actually, if, if we did the east property line as the front yard, then um, the design wouldn't change except for the west property line we would have we would have to ask an exception for a side yard uh setback okay so uh again not to put words in your mouth but um again your suggestion is that because the planning commission wanted a different entrance and had a perception that it could be changed that that was are, are you suggesting that that's a reason for their denial uh, of, of, of your plan development? Right, because they were saying, where is the entrance? And, you know, we have a, we have the, a door on the south property line. We have a door on the east side. We have a door on the north side. And uh, they wanted it to look different. So I, I guess the question is, how far do they, does their opinion go in determining the outcome of, of a, an applicant's project when they're the lay person and trying to come up with a different design? Yeah. In the, well, what, one thing that will be helpful um, if you can speak to, they based their decision on, as I understand it, um, as Katya laid out, uh, uh, standard C3. I mean, it, you know, again, they have to have, there are certain standards that are met and 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 uh, and your job as, as the appellant to help me is to help me understand how, uh, they're basing that standard, that C3 standard was somehow erroneous and not based on substantial evidence. And, and, and uh, you know, you're saying, well, that's their opinion and, and, and everything that, and that's fine. Uh, but is there anything else you can talk to me about, about how they're uh, basing their decision on a standard C3 that they didn't feel that was met or yes. you say so, that was, yeah. Okay. I could just say what I what I writ in the um, have written in the um, application for the okay. appeal. And I have read that. That is part of the record. But if you want to just maybe highlight that for yeah. me or walk me through that, that uh, okay. that that would be helpful. I got gotcha. you. Okay. So um, the decision for planning commission's denial was that the project does not meet standard C3 from section 21A55050. Uh, and um, the decision to deny based on C3 verbiage of setbacks are an error for the following reasons. If a design is made with strict zoning regulations, a far less desirable design would be built without the need of commission's approval. No public development application would be needed. Section C3A states visual character of neighborhood 
Um, designing to fit with two different neighbor types is a challenge. Uh, we have multifamily uh, zoning uh, around us and we have single family uh, zoning around us. We're multifamily, so uh, we should tend to be more like the multifamily structures there. Okay. Uh, the current design has two single story garages facing the driveway onto the property from Windsor. These garages are 10 feet tall. Uh, if we use strict zoning regulation, there could potentially be a three story structure at 30 feet tall where the current design is only 10 feet. So we argue that the lower structure will fit in better with the homes on Windsor. Uh, this also will satisfy section C3D providing adequate sight lines. The 10 foot structure will be much less imposing than the 30 foot tall structure and safer as cars, pedestrians and bicyclists navigate around the structure. So we, so all those verbiage we, is, is what we designed to. Okay, thank you. And is is there anything um, anything else you can point to uh, in the in the record, um, and, and uh, that that shows that anything was again either um, violating any any law, statute, or ordinance? And if you can help me point me out where you believe that ordinance was 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 violated and that and that there any lack of evidence that they based their decision on and and uh, again i don't I'm not trying to put words in your mouth i'm just trying to uh, uh make, right. make sure that i get everything out of you uh that i that i can uh, to base my decision on uh yeah. on what's so in that's there. right that's when i started with i understand the concept uh, of the uh, the difference of opinions, but yeah, um, that's why I argued in the beginning that it was what they made their decision based on false premise that the south property line is not the front yard. Got it. Right. And so, and it, so if the logic goes, if if um, if they made their decision on a false uh, premise that that decision would then uh, be false and that evidence is essentially erroneous is what you're saying that they Correct. based that decision on. Okay. okay. Yeah, so there, there's about 20 feet of the south property line that abuts Windsor Street, which is the public street. And so therefore that is the front yard that has the frontage. That's yeah. the only part of the property that has frontage. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? Anything else you'd like to to point out, or anything in addition to what you've already uh, written and prepared in the in the appeal? No, it's just the commission's opinion was based on false uh, notion that the south property line is not the front property line. Uh, and staff recommended that we stay with the south property line as the front yard as well. So we were adhering to uh, staff and what they recommended and um, what they thought it was the best and was supportive of that decision. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. Staff had actually recommended approval of, of your project. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, um, of applicants that uh, would love if that was the end, <laughs> right? Of course. Uh, it would be, be nice if only the staff was involved, but uh, the, the way it's set up is you do have a, uh, a public plan. Right. Well, I'm not. I'm not just talking about the whole project. I'm talking about the specific issue of the front yard. Uh, of the, the frontage, right. right. Um, right. And it, it sounds like, I mean, that, legally, that's what the front yard is. It is what it is, right? right? Because that's where the frontage is. Okay. All right. 
All right. Well, thank you very much. Anything else? I don't want to cut you cut you short. If there's anything else, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, anyone from the city that is going to respond, Mr. Nielsen? Looks like you have your. Yeah, uh, just uh, just really briefly. On. Yeah, um, and as you uh, probably read through uh, the brief that I put together, it, it is uh, exactly that. It's brief. There's not. Um, there's really not a lot of fact here to argue, because the law requires that in order to disturb a decision of a planning commission, the appellant needs to show uh, that the Commission's decision uh, was arbitrary and capricious or illegal, and they show that a decision is arbitrary and capricious uh, by proving that there was no substantial evidence in the record upon which the Commission uh, m made its decision. Um, and within these standards, we look at whether a reasonable mind could have uh, made the same decision based on the information that was presented. We had a staff report, we had testimony, we had a presentation, and yeah, although uh, the staff recommendation was approval, the commission took all of the information that was presented to it uh, into consideration. I don't know if you had a chance to actually watch the video of the planning commission meeting. If not, I, I would uh, suggest you take an opportunity to do that because I don't think that the commission was uh, under the wrong impression as to what was the front yard. I think they just didn't like the designation. And the concern that they had was that by designating the front yard in the way that the applicant did, it, uh, it created a problem uh, as far as the, um, the separation from the adjacent property owners that they noted uh, with respect to standard C3. Uh, it's that that setback was the relief that was being requested through this plan development, and the commission did not feel that that was appropriate. And I think it's it's um, pretty much as simple as that. Uh, I want you to keep in mind that plan development is a discretionary approval. If you look in the language in flip the screens here. It's actually uh, several of the sections in the plan development chapter uh, 21 a 55 use, uses the word may and particularly standards for plan developments 21 a 55050 states the planning commission may approve approve with conditions or deny a plan development based on written findings of fact according to each of the uh, following standards. Um, in light of that, uh, again, if, if this is uh, a a decision that's difficult for you, I would suggest that you take a look at the case of uh, Baker versus Park City, which is 405 Pacific 3rd 962, in which the uh, Utah Court of Appeals looked at language in the Utah Code regarding um, subdivision amendments. And they looked at the, uh, they, they pointed to the fact that the language in the code says, that a municipality may approve, and the standard um, in that statute is for good cause. But the court there said, um, you know, that the Park City didn't even need to find good cause to approve. They, there could have been good cause. Park City could have denied the application based on the fact that there's this discretionary word may uh, in the state code. And Salt Lake City's code as I uh, just read, uses that same may as a permissive term. It's it's a discretionary approval by the planning commission. So, uh, you know, in this case, they found that uh, that twenty one eight fifty five. I'll do this again. Zero five uh, zero five zero C three. It's to C three C three C. That's right. Uh, open space buffering between the proposed development and neighboring properties was not met. Um, even if they had found that that was met, they could deny it because it is a discretionary uh, approval. Um, I, I, you know, that decision in uh, Baker versus Park City may make some uncomfortable, but that is the law. And what they looked at was specifically the permissive term may. Um, and uh, so, Mr. Nelson, what's yeah. 
But one question I have, what, what's the purpose of having standards at all then if if the the may per permissive language is there in in the in the ordinance well that's exactly what the court of appeals examined in the baker case why are we talking about a good cause standard um but they what they found what the court found there was that even with that good cause standard uh the permissive language may gave the park city council the ability to deny that application I understand that the standards are there so that we have something to measure an approval against so that it is not entirely arbitrary and capricious, but um, they have the discretion to deny. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll give the, um, if the appellant has any any final any any final things to say or in response to the city that's fine if not that's okay too uh just wanted to give the appellant uh the the, the last word uh and, and then uh we'll, we'll move forward so uh M mike anything you wanted to add in response uh to uh to the city's uh comments there Gotcha. Am I, yep, am you're on. Yep. Okay. All right. Just just to uh, reiter reiterate, it was Amy on the commission that used untrue verbiage to say that the east is the front yard, and so and she said south property line is not the front yard. So it was her actual words that was in error. I was just relating to what the uh, gentleman uh, said about not understanding the front yard. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything, anything else? I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, well, um, I will take uh, this matter under advisement and issue uh, my written uh, decision uh, after I've uh, been through everything uh, thoroughly again. Uh, so um, we'll, uh, we appreciate everybody's time and that concludes uh, the, the, the hearing on, uh, on this, this matter. And uh, again, reminder, and if there's anybody else that joined us, the, the second uh, item on our agenda, the appeal of the administrative decision for the St. Mary's Stealth Antenna, because that is a public hearing, uh, that will uh, be heard, uh, again, by virtue of our uh, uh, rules that we have at the city, uh, that will begin at uh, 5 p.m. So that's in approximately 30 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you. And Bobby, you have uh, presenters. If you want to put that screen up, um, we'll continue for those of you that are staying on uh, staff wise, we're going to continue recording this uh, meeting. So there's no interruption in the recording just to let you know. Thank you.
<clears throat> for those of you that may be uh, watching this, um, we have a, uh, a public hearing um, item that will begin at five o'clock here in just a couple couple of minutes. Uh, it looks like we might have a couple of folks that are having a little bit of difficulty getting into the meeting, so we're working on that now. Matt, we have a few folks that um, looks like they're having some difficulty getting in, so into the meeting. So we're trying to work that out um, right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to check. Um, we have a call in user. This is call in user. I won't say your whole number 801231. I'm going to unmute you. Can you hear us? I can't hear you. Uh, what is your name? 
My name is Stephen Rich. Okay, great. Um, so we got you in. That's fantastic. And I see that I'm going to put you on mute until it's time for the uh, public hearing. Okay, sounds good. Uh, unfortunately, the video was not working. Yeah, sorry about that. We're trying to we're trying to get that worked out. It's all these get little bugs sometimes when we try to do these meetings online. Yep, understood. Okay, I'm going to put you on mute and we'll we'll call you during the public hearing portion. Thanks. No problem. Amy Burrows, are you able to hear us? I can hear you. Can. Yes. Thank you. Great. Are you do you want to speak during the public hearing portion? No. Okay. Can I change later? I'm sorry. Can I change my mind later? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll call I'll call you during the public I don't hearing. Yep. No. No worries. No worries. I. I will. I'll call on everybody in the public hearing and and ask if you'd like to speak. No problem. Thank you. It does look like we are waiting for our appellant. Wayne, is 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 it only video? I mean, can everyone still hear and get on and hear audio? Is that the issue, or is it? Yeah, that's, that's what seems to be the issue. It's interesting because the uh, appellants on the last um, for the last case were able to actually get in, um, and they were they came in as attendees, and I moved them them over. So. We're going to keep kind of we have Aubrey and uh, Kelsey kind of frantically working on making sure that everybody can get in right now. So, if you're okay with maybe going on hold for a couple of minutes. Yep, that's just fine. Thanks.
So Matt, we're working with the um, appellant right now uh, to to try to get the the situation figured out. So hopefully Great. we'll get this, we'll, we'll get this going here shortly. For those of you that have gotten into the meeting, we're just uh, running into a few little technical difficulties. Uh, we're getting those straightened out. So if everybody could just be patient with us, um, that would be great. It does look like the appellant, Brad Bush. Brad, can you um, unmute yourself and? Can you hear me? Oh, that's great. We got you in fantastic and we could hear you loud and clear. You know, the, the workaround is to use Kelsey's email address um, rather than my own. So, <laughs> yeah, interesting. We, I know we, we had on our last case, people were able to get in. So, yeah, we've got a, a few wires crossed. So we're, we're getting those worked out and hopefully we're, we're good to go. All right. Um, well, thank you. Thanks for everyone's patience as we uh, get the, the technology working to uh, accomplish our purposes tonight. My name is Matt Worthlin. I'm one of the appeals hearing officers for Salt Lake City, and we are continuing our appeals uh, hearing agenda tonight that began at four o'clock with a uh, a matter that was not a public hearing and by rules of the city, any public hearings are held after 5 p.m., which is why we are starting this uh, after 5 p.m. So we are now uh, begin with the appeal of administrative decision for the St. Mary's Stealth at Antenna located at approximately 2496 East St. Mary's Drive. This is case number PLN APP 2020-2020. 0889 uh, and the, the talent uh, Brad Bush is, is here and I'll ask uh, uh, just the staff to give us context for uh, this uh, matter for the administrative decision again I've read the materials and uh, so I'm familiar with that so just by way of, of, of summary for everybody in attendance and then we'll turn uh, time over to uh, uh, Mr. Bush uh, as the appellant uh, to, um, uh, if you will, make his case. Now, again, uh, I, I, th I think uh, much of what he wants to say has probably already been said in, in, in his uh, memo and materials, which are in the record, and which I will take into account. But. Uh, uh, Mr. Bush, if you uh, maybe by way of, uh, of summary, summary or emphasis can point out uh, things you'd like to just have me focused on, if you will, uh, as you give your uh, uh, presentation, that would be helpful. But uh, uh, and I know you won't do this, but I, I, I don't need you to read uh, your entire uh, uh, memo and materials. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and probably that's a relief to you. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, but it would be grateful for everyone. Everyone else would be grateful as well. But again, those those are materials that that, that I have absolutely will be taking into consideration on this decision. So uh, after Mr. Bush's presentation, uh, I'll give the city a chance uh, to, to respond, and then we'll open it up for public hearing again for those who are members of the public that are here. 
that that public hearing gives you an opportunity, uh, and and we will be limited to to two minutes a piece for uh, any any comments from each member of the public, um, and 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 so at that point, uh, Mr. Wayne Mills from uh, our planning department, the planning department of the city will will help uh, manage that process and we'll call and get everybody an opportunity that wants to speak to speak at that point. Um, and then we'll close the public hearing and give uh, both the city and the appellant again, a chance to respond or to make any final comments. So uh, uh, just, just wanted to give the lay of the land as to the process uh, th this evening. Um, so, uh, with, with that, uh, I think, uh, Kelsey Lindquist, I'll just turn some time over to you just to give us a brief summary and, uh, context. Thank you, Mr. Fields hearing officer, and thank you for your patience earlier. I do have a presentation, so I'll just share that. Okay. The issue of this appeal relates to the determination made by the planning director that the antenna expansion located on the roof of 2496 East St. Mary's Drive is a, self, is a stealth antenna and a permitted use. This slide illustrates an aerial of the subject property. I will briefly cover the background of the subject property and issue. T-Mobile received conditional use approval in 2005 for a roof mounted antenna located on the roof of the subject property. In 2020, T-Mobile replaced and expanded the roof mounted antenna without a building permit or a conditional use. T-Mobile was placed under enforcement in August of 2020. Subsequently, building permit applications were submitted in September 2020 for a stealth antenna. Stealth antennas do not require conditional use, so a building permit was issued to T-Mobile on October 30th, 2020. In relation to whether conditional use was required for the subject installation, the Salt Lake City Planning Director issued a memo that determined a wireless telecommunication facility on the roof of the subject property is a stealth antenna and is allowed subject to meeting the provisions for stealth antennas listed in 21A 40090E2F. The subject memo can be found in attachment C of the appeal response. As noted in the appeal response, staff addresses the determinations and subsequent claims starting on page 29 of the submitted appeal. There are three main determinations provided by the appellant. Determination one, permit required for the antenna array. Suggests that the antenna expansion is a roof mounted antenna and thus should require a conditional use for the installation. Prior to addressing what antenna type the installation is considered, staff addresses and should further address that there is an obvious conflict within the Salt Lake City Zoning Ordinance pertaining to wireless telecommunication facilities. The conflict includes the Special Purpose District Land Use Table located in 21A 33070, the Wireless Telecommunication Table found in 21A 4090E, and the specific self antenna section found in 21A4090E2F. In summary, the land use table for special purpose districts does not indicate that wireless communication facilities are permitted or conditional uses, but only provides a code reference of C section 21A40090, comma, table 21A40090E of this title. The first reference section directs the reader to the antenna chapter of the ordinance. The second reference provides a list of wireless communication facility types and an indication of permitted or conditional use for each facility type. Self antennas were left off of the table found in subsection E. However, they are specifically addressed as allowed uses in the following section found in 21A 40090E2F which is a subsection of 21A40090E. Per state code, an identified conflict within city regulation requires a decision in the favor of the applicant. For more information on this conflict, please refer to page three of the appeal response. In addition to the noted conflict, the Salt Lake City Zoning Ordinance Section 21A40090E2F clearly states that stealth antennas are allowed in all zoning 
Associated subclaims under determination one are addressed by staff from pages three to six of the appeal response. In summary, staff addresses the claims by providing explanations on the land use table conflict, the claim that the conflict is manufactured, and provided detailed information on the legislative history on antenna regulations, specifically stealth antennas. If you don't mind, I'm going to just shut my door. My puppy is screaming. <laughs> Sorry, he picks the best times to do that. Okay. Yeah, the the appellant you might object. The appellant might object to, uh, to having the, uh, you close the door because the puppy <laughs> may, may may help him. I don't know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, he's getting louder and louder. So I'm gonna just shut the door. Right. Uh, okay. Determination two. Compliance with stealth antenna definition. The provided definition of stealth antenna indicates that a stealth antenna can either be, quote, completely disguised as another object or otherwise concealed from view, thereby concealing the intended use, end quote. The subject stealth antenna is disguised as an elevator bulkhead, which is an allowed stealth antenna object located on a flat roof. The subject antenna meets this definition due to the appearance being both disguised as another object is concealed from view. The subclaims associated with determination two includes a further claim that suggests the stealth antenna does not meet the definition of stealth antenna due to the exterior material change associated with electrical equipment and HVAC units. The associated electrical equipment is permitted in the buildable area for antennas located within the public land zoning district. For more information, see 21A 4090E3 Additionally, HVAC units are permitted to be located on the roof. The photo provided within the appeal response illustrates there is no additional evidence of visible support structures for the stealth antenna. Kelsey, before you go on, can I just ask a, a question? And actually, it gets back to determination one uh, on, on the table uh, issue. And, and, and just the question I have, should it have been and this is just a question you may not want to answer it but should it have been just p all the way across on that in an ideal world if 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 you had um if 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 we could go back and fix either in a, an apparent or real conflict and misunderstanding would be would the best way to to have just put permitted all the way across all those zones or 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 is does that, does that make sense? It does make sense. I, I think noting the conflict now with this um, issue that has been raised, I think staff would like to clarify the land use tables. Yeah. In the future. Okay. Thank you. Of course. So compliance with stealth antenna standards. As discussed in the appeal response, the appellant's interpretation of the stealth antenna definition and associated standards is incorrect. The definition of stealth antenna found in 21A62040 includes the following language, completely disguised as another object or otherwise concealed from view, thereby concealing the intended use and appearance of the facility. This implies there are two options for the stealth antenna, first being completely disguised as another object and second, otherwise concealed from view. Given the grade changes associated with the subject property, the stealth antenna complies with option one and is completely disguised as another object. Per the provided illustration and the discussion on page 10 of the response, table 21A 36020C for height exceptions, permits elevator bulkheads and stairway towers to extend 16 feet above the maximum building height allowed within specific zoning districts. That does include the PL. The stealth antenna disguised as the elevator bulkhead is well within this requirement. Additionally, the appellant suggests that additional criteria should be applied to ensure compatibility of stealth antennas. The suggested criteria are not standards found within the Salt Lake City Zoning Ordinance, nor were they ever considered or adopted by the Salt Lake City Council, and thus would be illegal for staff to apply. 
Um, I provide a couple photos of the subject property, the western elevation of the subject property. This is the eastern elevation. This is on the property from the parking lot. And this is from uh, Roxbury of the stealth antenna. That does include my presentation at this time. Uh, Mr. Appeals Hearing Officer, I'd be happy to address any questions. Uh, thank you. No, no, no additional questions at this point. I appreciate that. Uh, so we'll invite uh, uh, Mr. Bush if, uh, if you'd like to take some, take whatever time you need. Right. Mr. Bush, I just thank gave you, you uh, privileges to be able to share your screen if you. Okay. I am uh, giving this a try here. You can, can see that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank Perfect. you. Okay. Well, thank you for taking the time to hear the appeal today. Um, at the uh, at the outset here, I I want to be clear that um, our objections to this cell tower are motivated by one thing, um, the, the protection of our children and families and to enable us to live in our homes without fear of the harmful effects of this cell tower. Um, this appeal addresses many aspects of the failure of the planning director in complying with the relevant ordinances, but um, you know, motivating all of this is a sincere concern for our children and families and the defense of our homes. Um, the the Concern about the health and safety impacts of cell towers is not new. But, you know, what what is is that in 2021, the science and understanding of the risks has evolved sufficiently. That it's clearly no longer responsible to place cell towers on schools. And doubly so in the heart of a residential neighborhood with the towering the tower projecting through homes rather than over them. Um, the, the health and safety concerns I've raised. Um, that the planning division has so blithely, blithely disregarded here are real based on science and research from leading and renowned toxicology and cancer research institutes from around the world. Um, actually, let me just uh, flip, flip through some of, uh, some of these here for you while I'm going through this. Um, You know, the cell industry and uh, the FCC continue to kind of live in this blissful ignorance and willful suspension of concern, kind of happy to reject all research as insufficiently conclusive to demonstrate harm. Um, while simultaneously doing nothing to support independent research, the federal laws here have vastly exceeded the rightful authority and usurped local rights in declaring environmental effects effects, quote unquote, the kind of genteel code for health and safety risks is out of bounds as grounds to reject where a cell tower is, is placed. And this, frankly, just leaves us, the residents of our community with no choice but to come up to speed on zoning laws to, to find ways to protect our families. And, you know, this kind of failure of our vital organs of government at every level to provide basic protections and right of self determination for our communities is, is a total tragedy. And that the fact that we as citizens are forced to resort to a forum such as this, where we're where we're forced to use our own time and resources to fight back against a city that's failed to protect us, and has a right and it has actually in fact fought against its own residents in favor of a deep pocketed wireless operator with extensive resources and access, a long track record of zoning violations is just a dreadful tragedy. Um, the circumstances really represent a fundamental rupture in the fabric of the social contract. Uh, under our constitution, the power of the government derives from the people, yet in this instance, it's been the organs of government that have perversely wielded the authority, given them to take action to suppress the will of our community, which is really the very source of the leg their legitimacy to govern. So as we get into the details of this, I just hope that you will Nevertheless, consider the, the context and the fundamental motivation obligation that we have to protect our homes and our children, and our families. Um, 
I also want to talk about the location of this particular cell tower and why it is uniquely problematic. Um, Indian Hills Elementary is dug into the hillside. Um, the, the school has a series of retaining walls and terraces behind the school that lead to a school field behind the school that is just that is at an elevation just below the roof line of the school. The school field is lined by homes that are at a raised elevation, which you can see in the pink. As such, most of the homes surrounding the east side of the school property are at or above the roof line of the school, and by extension, at or above the level of the cell tower. Cell towers are typically and ideally constructed on a pole uh, or a tower that is above the surrounding structures. Antennas project a powerful main beam that's intended to project above the surrounding structures and attenuate down the ground. And this puts broader and more efficient coverage by the cell, by the cell tower when it's built this way. But given the location of the cell tower in Indian Hills below surrounding structures and a large section of the coverage area neighborhood, the antenna has to project the powerful main beam through homes rather than over them. Um, the surrounding, the homes immediately surrounding the east of the school field where we live and all the children on the school field at eye level with the antennas are subject to the inordinately high level of radiation projected to blast through a service to service the broader area. We've measured the radiation on the field using a power density meter and I'll play the video of these recordings. Um, the meter has a max range of 2000 microwatts per square meter. And when the meter exceeds that range, it displays a one on the screen. Sorry, let me get back to uh Is everyone able to see that video? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, yes, we were able to see it. Okay. So essentially the the um the needles buried in on the school field. Some of our neighbors have taken similar readings in our homes and their children's bedrooms. Um, and I think it's important to note that um, the readings were taken on with only three of the now six antennas turned on. What this means is that our children are exposed to continuous round the clock, 24 hours a day radi radiation, seven days a week, 365 days a year for every year of their lives. These levels, of, these levels of exposure above what are allowed in residential areas or school zones in a lot of countries around the world. And the research has proven that children, um, let me get back here to, um, research has proven that children with smaller body masses and less dense tissue have a higher specific absorption rate per unit of power density. And specific absorption rate is a determinant of inde the index of radio frequency radiation's biological effects. Approving this tower condemns our children to this heightened level of radiation for the duration of their childhoods. As we consider this issue, I want each and every one of you who have played a role in forcing the cell tower on our community to consider the risks you've forced on our children. And the extreme anguish of parents who felt powerless to protect their children.
I'd like to turn now to the substance of the appeal. Um, first, uh, I'd ask that you that you carefully consider the complete analysis presented in the appeal I've submitted. Um, the staff report glosses over, disregards, misrepresents, misconstrues, and or attempts to discount valid analysis that fully withstands their response. We don't have the time in the setting for a detailed point by point review, but all the key arguments in the appeal remain unrebutted. So please carefully consider the appeals full analysis. It, I'm, I'm sure you can tell that I spent considerable time putting the analysis together. Let's turn to some key points. For most of us, determining the permit requirements of the cell tower is fairly obvious. Um, the land use table in 21A33.070 directs us to the wireless communication facility table in the antenna regulation section. Um, let me skip there real quick. Same slide that uh, Kelsey showed. Um, the antenna is on the roof and therefore clearly a roof mounted antenna. Um, and a roof mounted antenna on public land requires a conditional use permit per the table. Uh, this analysis is fairly clear and consistent with the plain language of the ordinance. The, uh, the record shows that the city also made the same determination revised before reversing course under pressure from T-Mobile. The planning director, however, well aware of the community opposition to this tower has attempted to assert several points that are nonsensical and incorrect in an attempt to justify issuing a permit without the public scrutiny that the conditional use permit process entails. First, you know, the, the planning director has asserted that the land use table refers to both the entire antenna section as well as the wireless telecommunication table in paragraph E of the section um, and applies this kind of provably false grammatical analysis that a comma separating the section and the specific table indicates a list rather than a reference. I mean, that's just not true. The grammar doesn't work that way. It's a, it's a, it's a reference. Um, and um, this is an important error that leads to correct incorrect conclusions. Rather, the reference in the land use table clearly refers to the wire, wireless telecommunications facility table in paragraph E alone. Um, I've laid out ample evidence and argumentation around this point. Um, the city's response doesn't directly address the evidence, the gra grammatical error in the determination memo. Instead, the planning staff reverts to the notion that there's a conflict in the ordinance. Um, but this assertion is based on circular logic. In order for there to be a conflict, you have to accept that the reference to the land use table in 21A33070 refers to the entire antenna regulation section and not to the specific table in paragraph E. But given that this interpretation is provably false, that the land use table um, note is only a reference to the wireless facility table, there is in fact no conflict, but rather a clear definition requiring a conditional use permit. Taking a hint from seven habits to begin with the end in mind, planning is eager to declare conflict in the ordinance, prefiguring that this will resolve in favor of the cell tower because of the state statute and associated case law in the event of a conflict. But ultimately planning staff does don't address head on the logic failures in the determination, namely that the land use table refers to the wireless facility table and that the stealth antenna subparagraph E2F says nothing about it being a permitted use as it does for every other antenna type not in the table. Um, you know, just just to kind of like quickly uh, click through this. Um, let's see here. You know, TV antennas permitted, satellite dishes permitted, uh, amateur radio facilities permitted. Uh, you know, then we get to the wireless ones. I mean, the bottom line is 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 there's a consistent pattern throughout all of the language. It's also has permitted. The only one where it says allow allowed only is in the uh, the stealth one, the stealth uh, paragraph. 
Um, clearly an antenna meeting the stealth antenna definition is foremost subject to the requirements of its underlying type. This is a, this is a unique feature of stealth antennas. They're always another type. Um, E2F simply states that a stealth enclosure of antennas are allowed in any zone, but E2F allows nothing, says nothing as to permitting because it's an antennas, but it, because it's an antennas underlying type in the wireless facility table that's determined as to permits. The planning staff claim that this argument is unsubstantiated while not addressing the argument. Planning is, has also conflated permitted with allowed, which are fundamentally different terms, one having a specific implication for permitting and the other having no, no specific impl implication for permitting. You know, allowed is permitted or allowed as a conditional use specifically defines the category of permit, permit required, but the word allowed alone without any qualification as to categorization of permit is insufficient to define the use as a permitted use especially in light of the fact that the wireless facility table states clearly that its purpose is intended to define the permit requirements by wireless facility type. Fundamentally here, there, there's just no conflict and the and planning is not, has not proven that there is a conflict and rather I, I think I've provided fairly strong evidence and logic uh, demonstrating that the planning director's determination is flawed and therefore illegal. Now to say a few th things about the legislative history presented. First, I continue to believe the plain language of the ordinance is clear um, and no conflict exists that justifies overruling the actual language in the ordinance and sifting through decade old material materials presented as legislative history. The, the language in the ordinance should be the focus of the dis discussion, not whatever was drug in and presented as legislative history. But beyond this, the legislative history presented is fundamentally unreliable as to its ability to reflect the intent of the city council at the time. Clearly, the language in the ordinance does not reflect what is in the legislative history presented. And although it's clear that the that planning is trying to read the intent of the documents they provide, but, but it is clear that the planning is trying to re read the intent of the documents they provided into the ordinance. What is presented in terms of planning commission minutes, city council meeting agendas reflects what planning in 2011 wanted in the ordinance. It doesn't reflect what actually wound up in the ordinance, nor what the city council, an entirely separate legislative body intended. Planning is attempting to conflate planning's intent as a petitioner with the city council's intent. We can't reasonably rely on the statements of the petitioner for an ordinance change is reflective of the intent of the legislative body that adopted an ordinance that materially differs from what the petitioner is requesting. This is why the materials presented are completely irrelevant in terms of establishing the intent of the city council in terms of language ad adopted, actually adopted in the ordinance. Taken together, the planning staff have made a determination using incorrect grammar to justify declaring a conflict in the ordinance to justify referring to documents that highlighted their own department's objectives rather than any actual intent of the city council, rather than accepting a clear and straightforward reading of the ordinance that a roof mounted antenna requires a conditional use permit. This is a really tortured attempt to pervert what's actually in the ordinances and really the opposite of the plan language meaning. And two other points that also deserve discussion. First, I've already noted that the motivation behind planning declaring a conflict is, is directly motivated by the, by the strategy that conflict in the ordinance uh, has to be found in favor of the land, land use. But it's worth noting that the case law presented in the staff report highlights that the logic of the court's ruling is that, that a zoning restriction is, in, is a derogation of the, of the owner's property rights. Interestingly, in this instance, the, the property owner, a public school board, objects to the land use. Salt Lake City School District finally coming to its senses and parent that and parents uh, with parents vowing not to send their kids back to the school until the towers were removed, has sent a notice of default to T-Mobile and subsequently asked T-Mobile Mobile to remove the tower, which T-Mobile has refused. School district appears stuck because it's in an abusive 30 year contract of adhesion like that is this is the case with these kind of cell tower contracts. That happened happens to have been improperly entered into without board authorization, 
but that said, the, the school district feels like it has limited options to force the tower off the, off the school given the contract. But given that this is public land granted to the school district for the sole purpose of educating our children, how does this cell tower, which has sent families fleeing from the school, accomplish this educational mission? So, in many ways, planning stride in defense of T-Mobile's rights here appears to really look beyond the mark and be out of touch. Um, so, rather than the zoning decision re restricting use of restricting use being a derogation of the property owner's rights, it would actually be consistent with the property owner's own request to the tower operator. Second, planning staff have attempted to explain away the common use proof that I that I established in the appeal that the city regularly refers to the wireless facility table uh, to convey zoning requirements. Their claim is that the city that city officials' response was in fact correct and reflected the permit permitting requirements based on what they knew at the time, but that T-Mobile subsequently submitted plans for a stealth enclosure. They determined to classify as a stealth antenna and the E2F requirements then applied. There are several fundamental problems with this argument. First, planning's, the planning commission's approach, the planning's, uh, not planning commission, the plan, planning team's common approach is that any tower can be a stealth, I, let me back up. If planning's common approach is that a tower can be a stealth tower and reduce its permit requirements accordingly, then the wireless facility table would never be cited without including the stealth and tenant ordinance language, since the wireless facility table is incomplete. And the likelihood is that every developer is gonna take advantage of this permissive stealth requirements. But the fact that the senior building services manager in co consultation with the zoning administrator, the zoning administrator in response to my query asking for confirmation of the permit requirements for the site, sent the wireless facility table alone without any reference to the stealth antenna subparagraph um, demonstrates the point. I'd like to reiterate that this proves that even internally, the wireless facility table is understood to be the determinate exhibit for wireless antennas. And, and, that, fa and that makes perfect sense because that's, that's what the ordinance says, that the table in paragraph E is there to indicate which type of facility are allowed as permitted or as a permitted or conditional use. Um, and I refer again, just to what's on the screen here, um, that, um, you know, when it says 21A, this table uh, is here to indicate which facility types are allowed as permitted or conditional use. Um, Okay. The second problematic dimension of this argument is that it's premised on the notion that roof mount uh, installed in August 2020 was subject to change and actually just a stealth antenna in process as claimed by T-Mobile. First of all, th this just isn't a plausible argument. The, the antenna installation was completed as a roof mount. Um, there wasn't any ongoing work at the time enforcement began. It was no longer an active construction site after the installation was completed. There's no viable claim that, the, that there was still an installation in process. In any event, T-Mobile's claim of a yet to be built stealth enclosure is really moot given their decision to install the roof mount an antenna without seeking permits. We believe the city has an obligation to require the permits stipulated in the ordinance for the installation that's been made. The city seems to forget the zoning ordinances are there to protect the surrounding community as well as the rights of the property owner. The city's actions here, like accepting a revisionist history presented by a developer like T-Mobile after its non-compliance is called out with full awareness of the reduced permit requirements in the face of our community's opposition is disingenuous, is a disingenuous defense of the community rights and protect, of protection afford, afforded in the zoning ordinances that were violated and is excessively generous to a violator. This approach creates a dynamic that essentially incentivizes unpermitted installations as a, as a developer can always, after the fact, say that they had intended to, to add a stealth enclosure. The reality is that civil enforcement lacks the resources to track all cell tower installations. In the absence of any meaningful penalty for unpermitted construction, T-Mobile has pretty 
has pretty clearly and demonstrably adopted a strategy of con conscious, unpermitted construction. T-Mobile knows full well they can fall back on accommodating support from the city to provide a pain-free path to compliance that circumvents conditional use scrutiny. They know that nine times out of 10, no one will notice their unpermitted construction and they will get away with it. And the consequences of getting caught are minimal. This approach is highly biased in against residents in favor of the cell developer and abrogates the protections for communities defined in the ordinance. This is a recurring theme with the city's handling of this issue. They, they seem to view developer compliance as the ultimate goal rather than seeking balanced outcomes for communities and property owners as is ostensibly the objective of zoning ordinances. So our communities ask is, is that our rights be respected and that T-Mobile be required to contain a conditional use permit for the roof mounted antenna they erected in violation of the zoning ordinance. Um, now, moving on to the question of whether a facility qualifies as a stealth antenna. Again, this is another case where the answer is entirely obvious to anyone but the planning department. There's absolutely nothing stealth about this tower. The towers are the, it towers over a flat nondescript roof on the, of the school. It looks clearly out of place. It's a monstrosity. The ordinance clay, lays out clear requirements for an antenna to be considered stealth. Um, you know, from that it needs to be disguised as a bulkhead or otherwise concealed. That it has to conform to the dimensions of the elevator bulkhead and has or has to be in concert with its surroundings. Um, the facility meets none of these requirements and certainly not all of them at once. This is obvious to all of us who live in the vicinity and are forced to look at this every day. Now I'll walk through how this facility is out of compliant out of compliance with these requirements. First, the antenna facility is not entirely disguised as an elevator bulkhead or otherwise concealed from view. The plans call for a staircase to access the antennas. Elevator bulkheads don't have staircases. The facility has obvious wires running out of the area of the antenna mounting. Let me get some. Um, elevator bulkheads don't have wires running out of them. Additional HVAC units that are not part of the school originally have now been added to support the cell tower, none of which are required for an elevator bulkhead. None of this conforms with the requirements that the facility be entirely disguised or or otherwise completely concealed from view. Planning attempts to explain this away that HVACs are allowed on the roof or that there's a provision for where electrical equipment should be located, but none of these responses address the underlying argument that there's element that these elements betray the installation as not being completely disguised or concealed from view. If the facility does not meet these concealment requirements, it obviously fails to be stealth. The explanation provided by the city that so long as the installation complies with paragraph three of the wireless antenna subsection related to electrical equipment, that it's compliant is an utterly farcical claim based on the notion that it somehow exempts all the wires and equipment that so obviously give away what's under the enclosure from being concealed from the concealment and disguise requirements of the stealth provisions in E2F. The city also tries to discount the evidence that the faux brick on top of a white wall disqualifies the enclosure from being completely disguised as another object. But elevator bulkheads are built as a single structure and don't have metal braces separating a top structure that is larger than the, than the lower structure. The, the antenna facility clearly doesn't meet any of either of these requirements as being completely disguised as another object or otherwise concealed from view. Um, and planning has also submitted zoomed out photos in an attempt to, to, to counter our zoom it, zoomed in photos. But, you know, here's the reality. All the photos I shared were taken with a phone camera. All of us who own property surrounding the school can see all the things that are in the photographs. The school field is used by the public all day and everyone in the field can see the same things. Taking a zoomed out photo that do doesn't make them go away. In fact, all the elements I've pointed out are visible in the city's own photo. You just have to, you just have to strain to see them. This isn't the case with the naked eye and many of the perspectives are, are available to the public. Moving on to the question of whether the structure conforms to the dimension of the object it's disguised as. I want to clarify the a point made in my appeal that appears planning is misunderstood. 
an elevator bulkhead only rises 12 to 13 feet above the top surfaced floor. So that's like the, 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 the finished floor inside the building, not above the roof line. That means that in most cases, an elevator only minimally breaches the roof. And this is evident as the stealth enclosure is built on the actual elevator bulkhead for the school elevator and the white shaft below the faux brick enclosure. The bulkhead, this bulkhead rises four feet above the roof line. The only instance in which an elevator bulkhead would extend 16 feet in the air would be if the elevator serves as the roof itself. Thus, there is allowance in the code for a 16 foot structure, but the planning director's memo clearly describes only the plausible use of the elevator to service the two floor, internal floors of the school in his assertion that the structure is in concert with its surroundings. But he makes no attempt to justify that the elevator needs to service the roof itself. To plausibly accept that the elevator bulkhead should be 16 feet, one must accept the plausibility that an elevator school elevator would surf, service the roof, which is neither plausible nor argued by the planning director as such. Additionally, I provide evidence that no other school has an elevator that services the roof. The bottom line is the structure cannot plausibly meet the requirement of conforming to the dimensions it's disguised uh, and, and being in concert with its surroundings. The planning director memo takes the tack of evaluating the stealth provisions individually in a vacuum, allowing the most advantageous possibility for the cell tower developer for each individual standard of, of the stealth provision in E2F, while not considering that all the requirements have to be met concurrently. With respect to the question of whether the tower is in concert with the surroundings, again, it's fairly obvious. I don't think anyone in our community feels like it fits in or meets the definition of being in concert with its surroundings. The point I try to make is that the conditions and circumstances described as allowable in the planning director's memo taken as a whole fundamentally fail any reasonable litmus test for this being a stealth antenna. The rationale for each individual condition evaluated in a vacuum or stretched so far to fit a square peg in a round hole and to accommodate the cell tower that they don't, they don't fit together. Uh, the appeal contains numerous photographs that just demonstrate that the school's roof is flat and has very little else of note on it. This is this is substantial evidence in the record. It's it's a flat, nondescript roof, and the massive structure now there is obviously out of place. It's out of proportion. There's nothing stealthy about it. There's nothing about it that makes it in concert with its surroundings. Um, the, the standards proposed by the planning director in the mini memo continue to the pattern of of setting the lowest possible bar for narrow compliance with standards taken individually in a vacuum and not considered holistically. And the clarifying logic I've suggested is intended to provide a litmus test for whether a, a, an antenna facility holistically meets the standard required for, by the ordinance. In conclusion, we don't believe that the antenna meets any of the stealth antenna standards. Given the, the entirety of the circumstances that T-Mobile erected an unambiguously roof-mounted antenna on the roof without permits, that the plain language of the ordinance clearly requires a conditional use permit for the antenna that hasn't been obtained and further that the antenna meets none of the standards for the stealth antenna. We ask that you find the determination was made in error and require the applicant to obtain a conditional use permit as required under the ordinance. And finally, I wanna reiterate our profound concern with the planning division's handling of this matter. The, the planning director's memo reflects a grotesque perversion of the ordinance is meant to facilitate balanced land use outcomes in favor of a cell, cell developer with a long track record, of zone, track record of zoning violations and against the residents of the city. The behavior of the senior planning staff to force issuance of this permit, despite my rights as an appellant to state that the permit issuance is a serious violation. The residents of our community in defense of our homes, our families and our children ask that this miscarriage of, the, of appropriate zoning be rectified and the decision be overturned. Thank you. Mr. Bush, thank you very much. Uh, will you be sure to uh, send your presentation materials uh, to the city just so we officially have them in as part sure. of the record? Okay, thank you. Um, great. So I'm uh, Wayne. With your permission, I, I'm going to turn the time over to you. We we're, we'll now open the public hearing, and again, we'll give anybody who wishes to speak uh, uh, two minutes. 
and, and if you could keep your comments limited to the, the the issues at hand, it's not it's not as helpful to me just to say uh, I don't want this antenna. But if 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 you can speak to the substantive issues uh, as as Mr. Bush did, that that would be uh, most helpful to me. But on the other hand, we're not going to cut you off if you say whatever you want to say. So. Uh, okay. but, uh, but, um, anyway, Wayne, I'll let you kind of direct, uh, and identify those who wish to speak and, uh, make sure they get their voices heard. Great. And Thank one thing, you. one thing just to mention quickly is, is hey, that a lot of neighbors have, have had a hard time getting into this meeting. So, sure. um, there, there, there seem to be a lot of technical complications. So look for emails to the extent that, uh, yes, everyone gets a chance to speak. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up and, and, and we will include any comments received, um, you know, candidly, uh, you know, throughout the day today. Um, so, if you want to send in those emails, and I think they direct those to you, Kelsey, is that right? Uh, so, those should go to Kelsey Lindquist or candidly anybody in the planning department. If those get those two, then, then the, they alert me when those comments come in and I have already seen some of those comments that have come in. Uh, be, prior to the hearing. And, and so, yes, please take advantage of that and, and share your thoughts and, and, and put, if you don't have an ability to uh, connect on the, on the hearing today. Wayne. Um, thank you. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate, we, we did receive um, a few emails today that were forwarded on to the appeals hearing officer. The 1st person I'm going to start with is, and, and I apologize if I did not get your last name, right? Matthew. Uh, Kamo, um, you sent an email in. I can either read your email or if you would like to, to speak, go ahead. Am I muted? No, nope, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I sent an email. Um, I, my backyard abuts the, um, playground of Indian Hills and I'm in my backyard now. And when I look at Indian Hills, I see a big, big box on top of the roof that I know is emitting radiation that I, and I don't know how that's affecting my three-year-old. Um, when I bought the house, I don't think the cell tower was there or at least not one with as high of power. And I know that when Brad had someone come out to independently gauge radiation. Um, the amount of radiation in my backyard was above the limit that was dictated as safe by um, the European Union, I believe, um, but within guidelines for the F FCC, if that's correct. So I, I just don't know if there's been long-term studies. I don't know how this is affecting my three-year-old or my one-year-old. Um, I had planned on sending my kids to Indian Hills and now my wife and I are considering maybe sending my kids to private school instead. My foot. Oh, thank you. Hi. So I'm going to mute. Oh, sorry. I, I, I just muted you. Um, I apologize, Matthew. Were you, were you done? My three year old decided to come outside and. Um, I was going to mute myself because I didn't want him to <laughs> interrupt the conversation. So. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's go with uh, Amy Burroughs. Would you like to speak? I'm um, sure I wasn't intending to, but, um, and I've been following this issue from kind of when it first uh, reared its head because I was on the school community council at Indian Hills. I live in the neighborhood and I'm on the East bench community council. And the story just keeps changing when, I mean, when Brad first kind of saw these things go up on the roof, he was like, well, who approved it? Like, what contract is this under? Who got a building permit? I was like, oh, you don't, you don't need one. But that, it sounds like the more and more questions Brad asks, the more and more it's like, oh, well, that wasn't done right, or that wasn't done right, or that wasn't done right. Now to hear that the intention all along was to put, build it as a stealth tower on top of the existing elevator box is that's totally new because they installed it not that way. Um, and then left like the project wasn't still under construction before it turned into a stealth box. So it sounds like the process has kind of been um, maybe run by 
like Brad said, run by like, let's see how we can get this thing that's been built into compliance instead of saying, this is how you build a, uh, a cell tower that's allowed in our city. And I, I feel like that's, that is backwards. I think we would all agree. That's maybe not the point of zoning and um, the planning commission. Um, and it's a, it, it is worrisome that things happen in the city, not, not in the order it's supposed to happen and in favor of the big, you know, the big companies instead of the residents and neighbors. So I was surprised to hear a lot of that that Brad said, and it sounds pretty bad, but um, at any rate, maybe if the decision is to go back and, and look at doing a conditional permit, there would be more, um, more consideration made to it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go with, uh, this would be calling user 801231. Uh, would you like to speak? Yeah, this is Steve Rich. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. I, uh, I had emailed in the comment as well. I, I completely echo uh, Brad's presentation. I echo what Amy just said. I live directly east of the school property. I attended Indian Hills when I was a child. I have grown up on the east bench of Salt Lake. Um, I just could not be more disappointed in this entire process with how the city has handled it. We, I think Brad outlined um, the points, you know, quite, uh, quite perfectly. And um, the biggest issue for for my family, and I suspect for many, is that Indian Hills is is really the quintessential neighborhood neighborhood uh, elementary school, right in the middle of the neighborhood. There's no adjacent thoroughway. There's it's just right in the middle and on an ascending hillside. And the points that Brad was making regarding um, that main beam of a cell tower literally being eye level with adjacent homes, not to mention the upper level of the recess field that is used constantly. Having a home there, I can see it literally every day outside every window in my home. And it is used constantly, not just children, but you know, uh, it's a de facto dog park and countless neighbors use it. And, and the fact that I mean, we all joke up here where it talks about the FCC guidelines. It refers to nine minute, 30 minute. There's no extrapolation for 24 seven. And that's effectively what this is. This is not a tower that is over all roof line. It is literally underneath most roof lines in our neighborhood. Um, so I, I just, I think the unique topography of this school I think uh, for all the reasons Brad cited, uh, this this entire process has been incredibly disappointing, having grown up in this city and sort of naively assuming things happen the way they're supposed to happen. And then watching the way this has transpired has just been a joke. And I appreciate Brad and all the work he's put in. And, um, and I'm hopeful that this will be uh, rectified. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, call in user 801581. Uh, would you like to speak? Let's be calling I, I, user. I, I, that could be me. My name is Leslie Castle. I put my phone oh, number in, but I think there's good. a lot of 581 numbers up here. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's you, yes. So may I speak? Yes, please. Okay, I, um, I, Okay, I'm just coming. I missed the first part of the meeting. I just had a hard time getting in, but I would just like to make the observation that I think that there is more than one problem here that needs to be addressed. And um, we speak as though this tower is the problem, that the tower is some independent entity that just sprang up by itself, but it sprang up through a process through the um, district office with oversight by the district board of education. And um, so, I mean, the cell tower, while it is a problem, it is the result of a process that seems to be quite entrenched in the um, state office, I mean, in the district office. 
And um, I, I, I wish that there was time to hear from the district board member who could talk to speak to that, speak about that sort of oversight over that process that I know she has known about for many months and I would hope has looked at it and is thinking about how improvements can be made to that process in the office. And my understanding is that, this, that the district board oversees that office, that they, are the, that they are the boss of that office, at least the boss of the boss of that office. And um, so I'm hoping that we can keep that in mind, that this is a process that brought this into place. It wasn't some loosely construed mistake. It was a deliberate, well-construed um, process and then a ongoing cover-up. And as a citizen, I, I find that quite frightening and, and really disheartening that, that there's no accountability. I feel like there's no accountability short of a citizen doing what Brad Bush has done. And um, he is, is sort of an outlier to be able to manage something like this, but that can't be how the system works. And so um, I'm going to be so disappointed if, um, if something isn't done immediately. I mean, everyone has had time to think about this, and I know that there has been some, dis I wouldn't say dishonesty, but some misrepresentations on the part of the district office, things that have been said that, that don't represent the truth. Uh, for instance, an attorney who even came to the um, commu uh, school community council meeting and represented herself as representing the school community council members. I mean, this is, this is stuff that has to be looked at and fixed, not just for the cell tower, but for accountability in that office that the citizens of this um, community deserve. And so I guess, I, you know, I could say more about the cell tower, but I think it's so much bigger than that. It's so much more disappointing and um, disillusioning as far as trust in our leaders, trust in this organization of, of the district office. And I, I would just hope that that could be remedied immediately. They've all They've all had time to look at this. They all know what's going on. This idea we have to go back and look at this, it's like, no, you don't. You've had plenty of time to know. So, Thank you. Uh, next is um, Daniel Barthol. Daniel Thank Barthol. you. Yes, um, I agree with everything that was just said um, by the previous speaker. Um, I've observed portions of what's happened and the communications about it, and it really feels like the system has been massaged and manipulated and leveraged against members of the community who are upset about the tower or concerned about the tower. Um, I've just seen a lot of things that have made me very alarmed about what the local culture must be in the district or whatever. They clearly, I, I felt like they've been very contemptuous of us when we've asked questions or when we've tried to find out information and we have been misled. There has been dishonesty. It's very clear that there was, um, there was already a, an end in mind and a decision had been made and the community wasn't really being consulted. We weren't really, I feel that the antenna should be dismantled as quickly as possible. And the whole process needs to start from the beginning with the community being asked what they think, with everybody being invited to meetings. When we're invited to meetings, we should be told the correct time that the meeting will start. If, if Brad's told that the meeting will be about one topic, the meeting should only be about one topic. If Brad prepares a presentation, he should be allowed to actually give the presentation. Unfortunately, I missed the one he gave today, but it sounds like he actually got to give it this time, which is nice. But it's been a disaster, but it's been by design and it's been very obvious and clear. And so I just wanna say, I completely support what the previous person said and it mirrors what I felt and what I've observed in this process, so. <clears throat> Thank you. Next is, um... Elizabeth, I can only see part of the next dead, next dead, I believe. Um, Elizabeth, can you speak? <clears throat> yes, hi, this is Elizabeth's hus husband, James. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys. I hope you can hear me okay. We can hear you, Greg. Excellent. 
Um, thanks, Brad, for uh, for uh, presenting, and thank you to all you guys for attending and um, participating in this. I wrote a letter earlier today, and so I'll just echo a couple of those things that I said in my email. Um, I remember going out, so I live directly east of the antenna to slightly up the hill, and it's eye level with um, most of the windows on the west side of our house. I remember going out into the field one day with my four-year-old daughter and seeing this thing on top of the building and like knowing exactly what it was, like knowing there was a cell tower and being surprised, like how did how did this get here? When did this get here? Like just being confused and knowing that, you know, we just had some work done on our street and I had gotten a notification about that. Um, just now they're doing some construction work and we have stuff hanging on our door. And just knowing that typically like we're informed when there's something happening in our neighborhood. And then to have this there and not knowing if it's good, if it's bad for me and my family and my, my daughter and my health, you know, not just being confused and feeling left out has been really hard. Um, so I would just encourage everyone here to, I mean, I'm echoing what a lot of people have said, just to, the process doesn't feel like we were included. And I really wish that that had been different. Um, I appreciate all the work that Brad's done to, to, to bring this to the table. And um, um, I appreciate all you guys being here to listen and thank you for the time. Thank you. Okay, next is um, Katie Moore. Would you like to speak? Katie Moore. Katie, are you able to speak? I am. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I actually do not wish to speak. I'm just here to follow along. Brad and Great. I have been in communication from the beginning of this, so I just wanted to make sure I was up on the latest details. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, next is. I mean, he's not wrong. Like, I don't. I have no strong feelings about the cell tower yeah. at all. I. It would be fine with me if they removed it, but the way he's gone about everything has been like. Is this really, Kim Johnson? He's just not. Kim Johnson? Why he wants it Kim Johnson? I think Kim might have unmuted her. I'll come back to Kim. Uh, let's go with Scott Stone. Would you like to speak? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I also live on the field. I've lived on the field for 10 years. And the couple couple points I want to make. The first is that Brad has done a fantastic job reading through the ordinances and pointing out where there's been missteps. And I've read both his appeal, I've read your responses, I listened to the responses at the beginning, and I've read the ordinances myself. The reading and and the language is not complicated. It's very clear, it's very straightforward, and it's well written. And what he points out, this needing a conditional use permit is very clear. So I'll just leave that aside. The the, the comments about the commas and, and the interpretation of the language are just truly unacceptable. Don't wanna dig into that any further. Um, you guys know that. You need to just recognize it and, and deal with it. The, the other thing is, um, first of all, it went up in July. I have photos of it going up in July. The, the idea that it's been um, done in a Wild West format is very real. They, they, they went up and did construction, made changes, put up a bunch of new antennas. We have photographic proof, date timestamps of it. And the process by which they've seemingly buttoned it up and covered off on, on, on the requirements is, um, is, is invalid. But the question remains, why are we so supportive and, and so protective of T-Mobile's efforts to enhance this facility when they don't have to have it here? It's not, it's not a choice facility for communication, for connectivity. 
it, they would be better suited up on the hill behind all of our homes further from our houses where we can all benefit and not have dead spots. We only have it in this location because of its cost effectiveness for them. The, the power, the infrastructure that they're leveraging, the ease of access that they're leveraging um, is all good for them. And it's not good for the community, not with connectivity, not with the radiation, the proximity to the residents. So we're, we're, we're losing sight of, of what would be an ideal location where it should be um, for the sake of their costs, which is, which is very unfortunate. And these public opinions would be heard if we went through the proper process. We have a, a change.org petition of over 500 people that wanna take it down. We have a petition of residents around the field who also want to take it down, we would all like to be heard and we would all like the, the, the process to go through um, the way it's supposed to. All in there. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, Kim Johnson, I'm gonna unmute you. you I, I wasn't sure if you were ready to talk. I'm gonna unmute you now. Kim, do you wanna speak today? Can you hear me? Yes. I am just a community member and um, I have just been following again, following this from the beginning and just want to express appreciation to everybody's hard work on this. And I'm mostly just here to listen and be on top of it. Great. Thank you very much. You bet. Okay. And the last person I have on the list is uh, Stephen Kaiser. Stephen, would you like to speak? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all of the neighbors who commented on this and in particular, Brad, for just an amazing job presenting. Um, I've developed you know, multiple projects in different municipalities across uh, the, the valley. Um, and I will say, um, without a doubt, Salt Lake City has the strictest uh, requirements uh, to meet the letter of the law in terms of conditional use permits, uh, permitting, construction, um, every step of the Salt Lake City process takes longer, uh, is harder, uh, and is more scrutinized than any other municipality that I've been through, a process that may take uh, two months in Tooele or North Salt Lake or West Valley could take 18 months in Salt Lake City. So when I saw this construction uh, of the tower go up without a proper permit under the guise of something that it was not, I was dumbfounded. I cannot imagine how that happened. How did that get through uh, planning? And then when objections were made, uh, I was stunned at the response. I mean, <laughs> that is, everybody that reads the code can understand that this tower went up in violation of the rules. And uh, it seems quite clear that the planning uh, allowed it to go up and then justified it. And I'm not sure how, how that happens um, or how it happened in this case. Uh, you know, I've seen fences that were three feet off of where they should have been denied and forced to be pulled down. And here we have uh, a tower that potentially emits radiation that's detrimental, uh, particularly to children on a school that's at uh, ground level with a number of houses in the area. All of the uh, neighbors that have spoken tonight have been against it. And yet there was no comment period allowed because the, the, the developer uh, did not pull the proper permits and did not obtain the proper uh, conditional use permit, which denied everyone uh, public comment and a full understanding of what happened here and and what the, what the technology is and what uh, the technology emits in terms of radiation so 
those are my comments. I, I would point out that I think everyone that has spoken has been against this, which should say something. Uh, and I uh, am firmly against it and think that it should, uh, there should be a public process and a public comment period as required under the code. Uh, and uh, this conditional use, or uh, however this was permitted, it was not permitted uh, under the normal process of public comment, et cetera. And I would ask that it be uh, thrown out, taken down, and redone. Thank you. Thank you. That I've gone through the entire list. Um, I and I do not have any additional emails that have come in. So I believe that is, is, is everyone that wishes to speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And again, thank you uh, to all of those who have uh, taken the opportunity to spend time with us this evening to uh, share their, their thoughts and insights and, and voice uh, in, into these issues. Um, I will now close the public hearing, but I will remind, uh, again, just say in, in case there are any further comments that we will continue to receive uh, public comments uh, uh, today uh, and, and, and uh, we'll take those into consideration. So um, I, I'm going to turn some time now over to uh, the, the city for any response, final uh, thoughts, and and then we'll give uh, 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 Mr. Bush the uh, the final uh, word uh, on our uh, on on this matter. So uh, I don't know, if Kelsey. It looks like Mr. Nielsen uh, will want to say something. Actually, no, Paul, if you don't mind. I'd like to start and then Paul can address some of the health concerns that were raised. I'd like to start that the land use table in 21A33070 references the entire antenna ch chapter 21A40090. And the stealth antenna chapter is a sub section of that chapter, that main chapter. So you can find the antenna, the stealth antenna in 21A40090E2F. If the table was to only apply to all wireless communications, it would have only referenced 21A4090E and not 21A4090, which is what we discuss in the conflict section of the appeal response, as well as what the planning director addressed in his memo. In addition, I would like to talk about the, the issues raised with the permit history. I believe I went into enough detail in the response. But when staff or when the city was notified of T-Mobile's construction, it was placed, the property was placed under enforcement. Subsequent building permits were submitted approximately a month later for a stealth antenna. Now that time period between a building permit submittal and the enforcement case, the antennas on the roof appeared to be roof mounted, which is clearly stated in the staff response, as well as in the emails provided by Mr. Bush. However, the roof, the antenna is not roof mounted due to the provisions in 21A40090E2F because they built a, a elevator bulkhead around that antenna mount, which is permitted. And I do understand the code confusion, which is what we discuss in the appeal response and in the memo versus permitted and allowed uses. However, the legislative history is very useful in relating to what the intended language was, and staff does use legislative history regularly to clarify intent of ordinance language, especially when questions come up and there's a, an identified conflict. So the legislative history provided to you, uh, Mr. Appeals Hearing Officer, indicates that the stealth antenna modifications and amendments done in 2011 was to allow stealth antennas everywhere. Because the conditional use standards in 21A54080 deal with aesthetics. So the conditional use for roof mounted antennas would take you to 21A54080, which would deal with the aesthetics. 
The thought being in 2011, we're dealing with the aesthetics of these antennas, thus eliminating the conditional use requirement. Um, I also wanted to touch on the visibility of this tower. The tower is not visible from the public way. I understand that the concerns from the gray changes are of concern for this neighborhood. However, that is not a standard found in 21A 40090. And I can address any other questions. Other than that, I'd like to turn the time over to Paul. Thanks, Kelsey. Mr. Nielsen. Yeah, first, uh, Mr. Worthen, I wanted to um, address um, a lot of the, the conversation in this appeal has been about the uh, potential health hazards of a wireless antenna. And, um, you know, it's, it's certainly the right of the folks who are here today to uh, express those concerns, uh, but it's absolutely something that the city cannot consider in um, an application for a wireless antenna. And since this matter is being heard de novo, and Mr. Worthen, you're standing in the shoes of uh, the land use authority here, um, you are bound by the same rules. Uh, Ms. Lindquist's staff report uh, on page two cites uh, 47 U.S. Code 332 subsection C7B Romanet 4. Federal law is very clear that um, while local governments do have the authority to consider uh, these, these applications in light of their own zoning regulations, we cannot consider the health impacts of the, the wireless uh, antenna device. We just absolutely cannot. And that was reiterated uh, just a few years ago by the US Supreme Court in uh, T-Mobile versus Roswell, Georgia. Um, I also want to say that uh, there's, it has been asserted that the city has some bias uh, in favor of T-Mobile. Now, you know, I assure you that we're not some sort of secret cabal that loves cell antennas. Um, we have, as you know, Mr. Worthlin, a state legislature that is heavily influenced by development interests. And as you'll read in Utah Code uh, Section 10-9A-306, we are required, required by the law to de decide land use applications in favor of land use applicants and can only deny them when they are clearly prohibited by the plain language of the code. That same standard is also applicable to an appeals hearing officer uh, pursuant to Utah Code 10-9A-707, which it's the standards that govern um, these administrative appeals. Uh, we've talked about the language in the code that establishes what a stealth antenna is. And in order to overturn that decision of the planning director, uh, you would have to find that the plain language of the code clearly prohibits uh, a stealth antenna and the interpretation uh, that was made by the planning director. I think that's gonna be really, really difficult uh, to determine. Um, I wanna make uh, one last legal point, and that is that the federal law requires that we allow these types of uses. Um, we can uh, apply our codes as far as uh, stealthing requirements and, uh, you know, to some extent locations, but um, 47, uh, Title 47 of the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, Section 1.6100 dictates how cities are supposed to treat um, modifications and replacements of these wireless facilities. And it's very, very clear in that section that we cannot deny them unless uh, there are certain dimensional parameters they exceed 
and I'm confident in this case they don't exceed those parameters. Um, so we can have this conversation um, about uh, the city shouldn't allow these, but our hands are tied. Let me just say one final thing about some of the pejorative things that have been said about city staff in this case. Um, I take exception to the accusation that city staff somehow uh, has it out for the neighborhood. That's absolutely not true. The city staff is doing their best to apply the state and federal laws as they have been uh, presented to us. Um, I, I am confident that there are similar concerns that have been expressed here, but we cannot uh, let things that are outside the scope of what we're allowed to consider dictate the decisions that we make. And uh, that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that. There have been some fairly pejorative things said about staff uh, as to staff motivations. And um, there's been absolutely no evidence of that. It's just accusations. And you know that that doesn't have any place here, and it certainly doesn't have any place in the hearing officer's decision of this matter. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, Brad, uh, Mr. Bush, I'll turn the uh, time over to you for any final uh, comments. Yeah. For, first, I, I just want to say that I object to everything that uh, Mr. Nielsen has said. Uh, it, first, there's a there's a gross asymmetry where he as a as a as an attorney representing the city is able to come into a forum like this where i'm unrepresented um you know i'm, I'm just a, i'm just a guy trying to trying to keep his family safe i don't i don't have an attorney to represent me um to provide counterpoint to all the arguments that he's made totally inappropriate um his to his point but that i've that i've made pejorative assertions about the city without evidence I would direct you to the uh, 20 pages of evidence that I put into the memo. I mean, these are fallacious assertions. Um, to the to 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 again to speak to this point that um, that the health um, and safety cons um, issues cannot be a consideration. Um, one, I'm 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 so glad to hear that there are people out there that that. Uh, that don't have to worry about that. Um, I think you've heard from many of us here who have to worry about that every night, every day. When I go out and on the, on the trampoline, when I when I play with my son in the in the sandbox, it's it's that that's it's that meter buried continuously, and and I'm not the only one. You've heard from you heard from a lot of our neighbors like this is this is an ever present concern that we're forced to deal with now here's the reality you can absolutely consider it can it be the basis upon which you make a decision no it can't based on 1996 federal telecommunications act is it a consideration it absolutely should be a consideration um and you know and mr nielsen you know I, I think I think the problem here is that the city kind of takes these positions of, you know, it's 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 an alligator arm assertion that there's nothing we can do and you know we're we're, we're our hands are tied. This just isn't isn't the case. Um, there are, the, you know, the, the, there there are so many flaws. They're, they're, they they've pushed the envelope in every possible way to make this work in favor of the cell developer. All of us as, as a community are dumbfounded as to why. Um, and, you know, just going back to, to, to Kelsey's uh, points, I mean, you know, she, she's essentially just kind of recapping everything. Like there, there's, you know, all of the evidence still stands in the, in the appeal memo. So again, I just want to reiterate, you know, this, this is a matter of, of, of fundamental concern for, for us as a community. Like we're coming here not, I mean, we've we've put out a lot of arguments out there. This is a fundamental human issue. Um, this is this is about moms and dads worrying about their kids. And again, there's the 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 science on this is is a whole is a whole thing to talk about, and we're not going to spend the time here. But you know, 
you, as you can tell, we're we're not we're not conspiracy theorists or or you know people that that that, that don't dig deep into issues. This, these are based upon the studies from the large from the largest institutions out there in the National Toxicology Program, part of the National Institutes of Health, working on commission of the FDA in a 10 year, $30 million study, concluding that there was DNA damage and, 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 and tumorogenesis in rats. Okay. Now the, the FCC can claim all day long or the wireless industry can claim all day long that we, we shouldn't, shouldn't look to rat models. And I agree, but I, but I just wonder who's going to, who's going to put up their kid for the, for the 10, 10 year cell radiation study. And that's the whole problem. Like there, we're never going to get enough proof for anybody to be able to, to, to prove human harm because the, 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 no one, no one's going to sacrifice their kid for it. And so in the meantime, the, the, the wireless industry, the FCC, and evidently Mr. Nielsen are comfortable um, talking about how this, is, this isn't something that we should consider. But this is absolutely what we, what every one of us have to go home and think about every night because of the, you know, the, the failure of all of the organs of government to protect us. So, I ask you to consider this on behalf of this community to to find this determination and error and 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 allow us to pursue the appropriate process under the ordinance. Thank you very much, Mr. Bush. Um, and, and again, thank you to everyone here. Uh, Mr. Bush and, and, and those he represents in the community, the other community members who have spoken out uh, and, and our city staff, uh, all who uh, have, are working on this issue. And uh, I, you, everyone has given me uh, a lot to think about, a lot to consider. And I, I will take this uh, matter under advisement and issue uh, my decision uh, when I'm ready in the coming days. Uh, and so that does conclude our uh, appeals hearing tonight. And again, uh, welcome any additional uh, comments, if, if any, uh, uh, through the rest of the day that will leave the public comment open until then. Uh, and again, thank you very much and, 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 uh, I wish everyone a, a, a good evening. Good evening. Thank you.